Good to go. Welcome. We're glad that you're here for our uh, annual Reformation Conference. Thanks for coming out. And uh, we've got more people coming in. Thank you. Uh, come on in and make yourself a home. Yeah, we, we, clo- we close this off just to, for the, to be able to see the screen. Um, there's a pocket right here, right up front, if you want, if you want to come up front. <laughs> Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we're thankful that you're here. Um, we, we we went light on refreshments this year. Uh, we have we do have um, drinks that we uh, coffee, both caffeinated and decaffeinated versions of coffee. We've got water, and we have a we have a book table um, in the uh, in the fellowship hall. Um, we uh, we we have a just enough cash. We think we can probably make it. Um, if you if you have a check and you'd like to write uh, write a check for it, or we'll even take an IOU uh, if uh, if that's the way things work. So, uh, uh, but we're we're excited for this year's conference, and we're thankful that that uh, Dr. D. G. Hart is here with us from Hillsdale uh, College, where he is an associate professor of history. He's been there for the past ten years. So uh, uh, prior to that, he uh, lived in the Philadelphia area. Uh, and was uh, has been uh, held a number of positions at different uh, uh, different uh, institutions over the years, and I, I, I there are more than I have time to list here. But uh, he holds a, a Bachelor of Arts from Temple University in Philadelphia, actually in film, which is something I discovered while I was doing my research. And then uh, three master's degrees: one from Westminster Theological Seminary uh, in Philadelphia, uh, one from Harvard, and one from Johns Hopkins. And then uh, he received his PhD from Johns Hopkins as well. Uh, he's taught at, uh, at uh, Wheaton College, at Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia, Westminster Seminary, Seminary in California, and now at Hillsdale. And he's the author of numerous books and articles, uh, ranging uh, in topic from uh, Machen to Mencken, uh, from a narrow focus on the OPC to a, uh, a focus on broad evangelicalism. And uh, from what I read in my, in my uh, intel research, uh, I believe you're currently finishing a book on conservative Roman Catholics and American exceptionalism, and also a spiritual biography of Benjamin Franklin. So do you, when are those, uh, when might we expect those to hit the shelves? Uh, American Catholic is out. Oh, it is? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, and Franklin may be out next year. Awesome, okay, well, that's great. Um, uh, Dr. Hart is a longtime ruling elder in the OPC. Uh, I, did, I don't have any stats on that, but I know you've been around the OPC for a long, long time, uh, and he currently serves uh, as a ruling elder at Hillsdale OPC, uh, right there in Hillsdale, Michigan. Uh, he also serves uh, our denomination as a member of, uh, on the Committee of Christian Education, and he and his wife, Anne, uh, have been married since the 1980s. <laughs> so leave it at that. I won't get any more specific than that. Um, uh, we're glad for those of you who are joining us uh, virtually this year. Uh, this is the first time we've done a, uh, a real-time live stream of it, and so uh, it'll be interesting to see how many of you have uh, joined in. We, uh, we're going to try to take questions. There will be a time for questions and answers. Uh, for those of you who are joining us virtually, if you'd like to ask a question, we just ask that you type it into the comment section on Facebook. And then, uh, and then our our, uh, our tech guy will uh, he'll get the question to Dr. Hart, and we'll try to respond back. So we're going to try it. It may be a little clunky. We'll do the best we can. Uh, but uh, we're glad that Dr. Hart is here, and welcome you to come on up to the to the podium. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you for that kind introduction. Although I don't like. Um, Baby boomers don't like hearing that they're getting old. Uh, Maybe all generations um, have that problem. But uh, the other thing, I'm a little disappointed that there's no t-shirt for this year's conference that that there was back in 2017. Though I I think I saw a banner outside. You did. So maybe maybe that um, makes up for the the t-shirt. Oh, there's, I'll tell this some other time, maybe, maybe uh, tomorrow, um, about a banner in Escondido during the Billy Graham crusade in um, 2002. Anyway, enough of that. Um, thank you very much. Nice to be here. Um, I was in the Dallas area for the General Assembly about 18 months ago, I guess, 13, 14, something back when life was relatively normal. Um, and it's nice to be back in the area. Uh, so, 
in case you didn't know, that's Jay Gresson Mage. Um, that shouldn't maybe be a surprise. And tonight I'd like to talk about um, Machen and old school Presbyterianism, uh, w basically with, with the idea that you can't understand Machen or the OPC, Machen being the leading founder of the OPC in 1937, without understanding old school Presbyterianism. And in the, in the world of church history, it may be a little geeky to know the difference between old and new school Presbyterianism, but for conservative or confessional Presbyterians in the United States, maybe even Canada, um, old school Presbyterianism re represents something important. And part of that is because of uh, its associations with Princeton Seminary, which for, oh, roughly 120 years was the, um, the leading voice of Reformed Orthodoxy in the North, Northern United States, and then even the United States for a time. Um, and I'll get to that in a bit, but so this is a part, I'm not really good at tech. Uh, so this is my, my way of not having sheets to pass out and saving a few trees. This is a paragraph from Machen's uh, opening address at the Convocation of Westminster Seminary, September of 1929 in downtown Philadelphia. And it's here mainly to show that he was connecting Westminster and what was going on in his mind with what he was up to with Princeton. So he says, no, my friends, though Princeton Seminary is dead, the noble tradition of Princeton Seminary is alive. Maybe I'll go off the sheet so that you can hear me better. Um, <clears throat> Westminster Seminary will endeavor by God's grace to continue that tradition unimpaired. It will endeavor not on a, on a foundation of equivocation and compromise, but on, on an honest foundation of devotion to God's word to maintain the same principles that the old Princeton maintained. We believe first that the Christian religion as it is set forth in the confession of faith of the Presbyterian church is true. We believe second that the Christian religion should be proclaimed without fear or favor and in clear opposition to whatever opposes it, whether within or without the church, as the only way of salvation for lost mankind. On that platform, brethren, we stand, pray that we may be enabled by God's spirit to stand firm, pray that students who go forth from Westminster may know Christ as their own savior and may proclaim to others the gospel of his love. Aside from what those three points that Machen mentions here, it's striking that he mentions Princeton twice, and then the Presbyterian Church and its confession of faith. So Machen is situating, even though Westminster was not a denominational school and still is not, uh, he was situating Westminster within this older tradition. And Princeton points back to the old school Presbyterian Church. But before mentioning that, um, which is what I'll spend a fair amount of time on, what was old school Presbyterianism, I will, will give you a brief overview of um, J. Gresson Machen. Uh, so he grew up in Baltimore. He was born in 1881, July 28th to be specific. Uh, very prominent family. His father was a leading attorney in Baltimore. Uh, when I was in graduate school there, which is where Johns Hopkins is, if, if you don't know that, um, I, I had jury duty one, during my time there, and the, the, the room, the main room that people waiting to be selected went into, there was a big portrait of Machen's father there. So that's an indication of somewhat of the, of the prominence of the Machen family in that time. Um, and so he received a very good education. He was a member of a Southern Presbyterian church. Talk about geeky. If I try to un explain to you all the different splits between the northern and southern churches, between the old and new school churches in the middle of the 19th century. We would be here for a while, but anyway, there, were, there was a northern Presbyterian church, there was a southern Presbyterian church. They split in 1861, roughly, of course, coinciding with the Civil War. And then they did not uh, reunite until 1983, of all things. That's how long that sectional crisis theological implications attached to it, as well as 
sectional identities lasted among Presbyterians. Um, but anyway, he was a member of the Southern Presbyterian Church, uh, very well-connected church as well. Some leading professors at Johns Hopkins went there, as well as uh, Woodrow Wilson when he was a student and teaching at Johns Hopkins um, as a younger man. Uh, so Machen was not the sort of person you would think would grow up to be a part of the fundamentalist controversy. Um, I don't think he expected that either. But then um, he eventually uh, went to Johns Hopkins for his undergraduate degree and a master's degree. He went to Princeton Seminary to, um, and received a, what was then a Bachelor of Divinity. Today we call them master, Masters of Divinity, the preparation for a minister. Uh, and then he went to Germany to study um, the New Testament at German universities, German universities being some of the leading research institutions of the time. And then he came back to Princeton in 1906 and taught at Princeton until 1929 when uh, Westminster was founded. And then uh, the culmination of his career, um, the high point or low point, depending on your perspective, and I'll talk about that more tomorrow morning um, to bring you all back. The, um, he, he was instrumental in the founding of the OPC in 1936. And he died quite tragically, quite, uh, quite um, surprisingly, only six months after the foundation of the OPC. Uh, he caught pneumonia. Uh, this was a time before there were antibiotics to treat pneumonia, and so he died at a hospital in North Dakota, of all things. So that's a brief overview of who Machen was. Uh, now, what was Old Princeton, and specifically that gets us into the question of what, um, actually, I can put his, give you something else to look at other than text there. Uh, Old Princeton, Princeton Seminary, was founded in 1812. It was founded as the agency of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in order to train ministers. Now, that may not seem all that stunning because we take seminary education for granted, but throughout the colonial era of church history in what would become the United States, as well as the 18th century and even into the new nation. Most people, if they went into the ministry, men, sorry ladies, um, men would become an apprentice with an established pastor. And that's how they would receive their training. This is also true for law. Uh, person I'm about, about to mention here in a second, Charles Finney, before he became an evangelist, was, was an attorney. And the way he became an attorney was by becoming an apprentice to an attorney and then sort of establishing himself. So the, the ideas that we have about professionalism, professional schools, and the like had not yet set in. And it's somewhat unusual that a seminary would be the agency of a general assembly because, uh, for instance, if you know something about Austin Theological Seminary in Austin, which was a seminary of the Southern Presbyterian Church. I believe that was an agency of the Synod, which is the body that oversees the regional presbyteries in, in an area. So Princeton still to this day is an agency of the General Assembly of the PC USA, the Presbyterian Church in the United States. Um, so, and the reason for needing a regular supply trained by a school something of a professional school, was that in 1812, the United States was expanding. Uh, there still weren't states like Michigan. Michigan doesn't become a state until the 1830s. California doesn't become a state until 1850. Uh, people are beginning to move west, and people need churches on the western frontier. The western frontier at the time being places like Pittsburgh. Um, the western frontier keeps expanding. But still, because this new nation has gained independence and um, there's a need for uh, churches in these new areas being settled, uh, there's a need for Presbyterian pastors. And so that's part of the reason why Princeton was established when it was. It was not the first seminary. Andover Seminary is sometimes credited with being the first seminary. Andover was a, a Congregationalist slash uh, Puritan school founded in 1808. Uh, but we don't need to get into the history of seminaries here right now. So that's where Princeton was, simply a Presbyterian seminary at the time. <clears throat> um, so eventually, though, it's going to become an old school 
seminary. And what leads to the old school church, old school Presbyterian church, um, is a series of, of events which leads me to the, my third point, if you're taking notes, uh, which is the second, uh, it's sometimes called a great awakening. I prefer to use, call it a pretty good awakening. And even then, I don't think it was all that pretty good. Uh, I have a, a friend who's now deceased, taught history for many years at George Washington University, was giving a series of lectures in China about religious history, and himself not a believer, but um, he wanted to play around with this idea of calling things great. Why do we call it a great awakening? So he, he started calling it a pretty good awakening, and I, I picked that up. I owe that to Leo Rebuffo, uh, was his name. And um, that's probably even more true of the, of the awakenings associated in the 19th century with this second one, and it's associated with this figure, Charles Finney. Maybe you probably heard that name in some ways. You probably haven't heard good things if you're a, a committed Presbyterian because Finney was pretty much a rank Arminian in his theology, but he was an evangelist after being an attorney for a time. He um, started a series of um, revivals in upstate New York along the um, Erie Canal and eventually became a national figure having leading crusades up and down the East Coast. Um, and part of what made Finney unusual, aside from his theology, which emphasized at at the time when Andrew Jackson was uh, kicking off what we now call Jacksonian democracy, Finney was emphasizing people's ability and power to choose, just as they could choose to vote for the candidate of their choice with this expanded uh, electorate, so they could choose to believe in Christ. That's, that's a bit of a, um, a simplification of Finney's teaching. But with, with Finney was a greater sense of um, awakening and outpouring of Protestant endeavor to establish a host of voluntary societies that were uh, also promoting Christianity, Protestant Christianity in various forms. Uh, these voluntary societies were established to print and distribute the Bible cheaply. Bible societies, for instance, tract societies, uh, producing uh, cheap tracts for uh, wholesome reading material, rel rel religious reading material in the home. There were mission societies set up to send out missionaries both domestically but also this was the beginning of uh, foreign missions for Protestants in the United States. And then one of the big uh, agencies and societies formed during this time was the Sunday School. Sunday School became, in some ways, a common piece of Protestant identity thanks to the rise of Sunday Schools in the 1820s, 1830s. Um, and many of these institutions were founded, again, because of the need for religion and civilization on the frontier. Uh, if you look at some of the reports of the Sunday School Union, as I've done, you can see that people are going into a town. You have people coming from religious backgrounds. There's no church in town. How do we get these different people who maybe it may have been French Protestants, they may have been Congregational, they may have been Methodist, well, one way to do it is through a common endeavor of a Sunday school. And what this Sunday schools also do is teach people how to read, and it becomes a civilizing part of it. It's not simply about evangelism, it's also about um, civilization, bringing it to the frontier. Um, and, and Sunday school is now in decline, but for uh, most of uh, 150 years, it was just a benchmark of what you would do, even this fellow H.L. Mencken, about whom I've written, and uh, an agnostic, skeptical fellow from Baltimore, a contemporary of uh, Machen's, even he went to Sunday school as a, as a young boy, partly because his father wanted the house to be quiet on Sunday afternoons so he could get a nap, and so he sent the boys out to the local Methodist school. Mm -hmm. And Mencken has some very funny things to write about Sunday schools because he loved to, he loved to sing these these songs that they taught kids, it was the one time during the week that they weren't constantly being shushed. They could just belt it out, and he said he loved the old songs with all the fire and brimstone. And anyway, it's really quite, quite amusing. Anyway, so that was the second 
great awakening, pretty good awakening, with this cast of, a, of, of societies, many of them religious, some of them also political or social in nature, temperance, temperance societies encouraging people to drink less and eventually to abstain altogether, anti-slavery societies were part of this, prison reforms, hospital reforms, um, education for women, number of things percolating around the second pretty good awakening. Um, so that is the context out of which old school Presbyterianism emerges, which is roughly the fourth point as I'm going through um, my comments. Um, and what I ne also need to set in view here is in 1801, Presbyterians and Congregationalists established a plan of union for planting churches in the, in the then Northwest Territory, the Northwest Territory being the states, uh, the, the area where states such as, oh, well, where Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, I Illinois, and Wisconsin emerged. I'm pretty sure that's the Northwest Territory. The Presbyterians and Congregationalists, again, part of this westward move, were going to join hands in establishing churches uh, in these areas. And this raises a bit of a conundrum. Uh, how do Presbyterians who practice rule by elders, both at the level of session, presbytery, general assembly, how do they cooperate with Congregationalists who locate all church power within the congregation itself, which is a hallmark of Puritanism, Puritanism that came at least to Massachusetts and Connecticut. But anyway, given there's a new nation, given that both Presbyterians and Congregationalists were very big supporters of the war for independence and American independence, big supporters of the nation itself, it made sense for these two groups that had cooperated during the war to uh, cooperate together in planting churches. But that led to this problem of church polity. How did the, and it also leads to the problem of if one church is letting in bad apples, as it were, people who have Finney's views of the theology, how are Presbyterians supposed to adjust to that? So um, just to give you an example, a couple of examples of some of the concerns uh, that uh, led Presbyterians largely in Philadelphia and to the south, that's where the old school was. The new school, their opponents were largely in New York and above. And here's a hint, pretty much everything that's bad in American Presbyterian history comes out of New York. Um, and I'm actually pretty serious about that, but um, there's a, I haven't quite figured that out, but there is something to it. And conservative Presbyterians were usually located in Philadelphia. Um, so, Presbyterians who became old school were concerned about what was happening to their church by virtue of the plan of union, by virtue of the second great awakening and Presbyterians cooperating in these voluntary societies. These voluntary societies were in, in effect non-denominational. They were pretty much run by Presbyterians and Congregationalists, but you didn't have to be a member of those churches to participate in them. Um, so one major point of old school objection to the new school was theology. And I have here a slide uh, having to do with covenant theology taught in the Westminster Confession, which Machen has already mentioned. And I'd mainly draw your attention to, uh, this is about the fall, to point number three here, um, which is the third paragraph in that chapter. They being the root of all mankind, that would be Adam and Eve. The guilt of this sin, original sin, was imputed, and the same death in sin and corrupted nature conveyed to all their posterity des descending from them by ordinary generation. Now that, that idea of original sin, that idea of in being imputed with the guilt of your parents, going back all the way to the first um, person, or the first couple, is something that doesn't really make sense from an American notion of we all come into the world equal, free, and sort of all sorts of possibilities. And even we come into the world innocent. A lot of people would think that. And yet original sin te teaches something different. 
And in, um, in new school circles and in congregational church circles, again, think of, when you think of congregational, think of New England, think of Puritanism. Uh, at Yale Seminary Divinity School, people were, were questioning this idea of original sin and the imputed guilt that comes from Adam. So they were, they were questioning what this theology that's in the Westminster Confession of Faith, the theology that Presbyterian ministers would need to subscribe in order to become a minister. <clears throat> Even aside from whether it's true, which of course we all believe it's true, uh, this, was a, this was also a question that ministers in the Presbyterian Church were expected to take that view, but there were also ministers among this, these union churches who didn't hold these views. So that was part of this idea of imputation. Then also I have here, um, there is by the way a picture of uh, Alexand Alexander Hall, the um, oldest building at Princeton Seminary, where Machen lived actually for um, the time while he was living there because he was a bachelor, he could live in uh, larger rooms there. Um, but the other side of imputation or covenant theology or federalism is the, um, is the imputation of Christ's righteousness. Now, you don't see this directly in this chapter 7 of the Confession of Faith on the covenant, uh, but I would point you to uh, this second paragraph, which talks about the first covenant made with man, Adam and Eve, was a covenant of works, wherein life was promised to Adam and in him to his posterity upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. So there's one side of this federal theology, a covenant of works. Of course, Adam failed, and that's where original sin comes from. Uh, the, second, the next paragraph here, point number three, man by his fall, having made himself incapable, sorry, of, um, of life by that covenant, the Lord was pleased to make a second, commonly called the covenant of grace, wherein he freely offered unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring of them faith in him that they may be saved and promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto eternal life his Holy Spirit to make them willing and able to believe. So you have these two covenants, covenant of works, covenant of grace. This is just baked into uh, Presbyterian theology, Reformed theology more generally, as expressed at the Westminster uh, Assembly. And this leads to uh, this, our teaching of justification from the Shorter Catechism, which I should have put, made a slide. Um, but justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. There again is that language of imputation. By faith, Christ's righteousness is imputed to us so that all of the sin that was clinging to us is overshadowed by this righteousness of Christ and God the Father now looks at us through the lens of Christ's righteousness. And again, this, this is how important this idea of imputation is. But again, the theology of the time in the 1830s, and there were different ministers brought up on charges, heresy trials or trials executed against them, at least among the Presbyterians, not so much among the Congregationalists, that were um, questioning this theology. So what did old school Presbyterians do, they decided to reject, they just had this major church decline strategy, they just ejected a swath of the church, pretty much all of New York and into New England, uh, they extended it. Um, it. It's an amazing thing, there are very funny stories with the General Assemblies of 1837 and 1838 that, where this happened where you have sometimes commissioners getting there early, taking seats at the front of the church where the Gen General Assembly is, is, uh, is meeting, and they are able in some ways to get there first because the boat bringing commissioners from New York is late, getting to the dock, et cetera. There's all sorts of interesting little wrinkles to these stories. But <clears throat> I call your attention to where this, um, a Western memorial that was part of the justification for the split between the old school and new school 
churches in 1837 and 1838, which listed many of the objections to what the, the what would become the New School churches, what they were doing. And I have some of the points here. Uh, so one we have here, um, the formation of presbyteries without defined and reasonable limits or presbyteries covering the same territory and especially such a formation founded on doctrinal, doctrinal repulsions or affinities, thus introducing schism into the very vital of the body. Number two, the refusal of presbyteries when requested by any of their members <clears throat> to examine all applicants for admission into them as to their soundness in the faith or touching any other matter concerned with a fair presbyterial standing thus concealing and conniving at error in the very stronghold of truth. Don't get too bogged down in the details. This could sound a little bit like you're reading a manual for a new smartphone that you have bought or something. I mean, again, if you're into Presbyterian polity, this makes a lot of sense. The point I, I, I'm trying to establish simply by putting these slides up here is how much old school Presbyterians were concerned about Presbyterian church government and making sure that the church was well ordered. And it wasn't just an administrative problem. They believed seriously, as I'll show you in a bit, that this was the way that Christ had ordained and instituted his church to be ruled by elders and pastors, pastors being teaching elders in effect, and also to have the church overseen at different levels, say with sessions, uh, presbyteries, general assemblies. Uh, through these courts of the church, uh, elders and pastors were to oversee the work of the church. One more example, eight points eight and ten from this very lengthy um, uh, document, the, the Western Memorial. A progressive change in the system of presbyterial representation in the general assembly which has been persisted in by those holding the ordinary majorities and carried out in detail by those disposed to take undue advantage of existing opportunities. Stop there, just to say that if you don't have good rules for who can go to assembly and vote on these matters of the church, you can actually oftentimes shift the vote. <laughs> this is something we're thinking about too as Americans right now with, with uh, the way balloting is going on, but this is also something that they were concerned about here. And then point number 10, um, when have you ever seen years listed this way? The unconstitutional decisions and violent, oh, I took it out, sorry, and violent uh, proceedings of several general assemblies and especially, I took out eight, especially those of 1831, two, three, four, and six. They didn't spell out, they didn't write out 1832, 1830, anyway. Um, directly or indirectly subverting some of the fundamental principles of Presbyterian government. So, the takeaway from this split, 1837-1838, is that Pres the old school Presbyterians were very much concerned about covenant theology, uh, reformed orthodoxy, as it were, and they were also very much concerned about Presbyterian church government. Along with this, maybe in the backdrop, was a growing moralism or perfectionism that was also associated with the revivals that was telling people that certain things were, were sinful when they were not necessarily sinful, such as, for instance, requiring that Christians not drink, for instance, which was a, a major concern of the temperance societies. It may be advisable, it may be, may be uh, 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 prudent for people not to drink, but whether you could actually say from scripture that uh, abstaining uh, or drinking alcohol was a sin is, is a, is a, is a bigger claim. So those were, those were the concerns of old school Presbyterianism. <clears throat> Let me just check up on. So old school Presbyterianism, the old school Presbyterian church lasted from 1837 until 1869. I'll say more about the reunion of the old school and new school in 1869 tomorrow. Uh, which is an, also another important backdrop for trying to understand Machen as well as the OPC. But 
I would just make the point here uh, before leaving the old school that um, the professors at, excuse me, Presbyterian seminaries like Princeton, but also like Union Seminary in Richmond, um, uh, I'm forgetting the names of church, um, other seminaries, but there were se seminaries, a number of other places in the South where the systematic, people teaching th systematic theology were also writing um, books on church government as well as pastoral theology. Um, and there's an amazing outpouring of books on Presbyterian church government that comes out of the old school Presbyterian church. Um, and, s and many of these books remain in print. Uh, Banner of Truth has, has, has kept a number of those in print. Uh, our own OPC has republished the works of William Childs Robinson, The Church of God and Essential um, Element of the Gospel, which is a biblical theological argument for Presbyterian church government. Um, it's probably one of the best. It's, it's really well done. Um, and just to give you, though, an example of this, the, where this um, ecclesiology, this interest in church government, uh, where the rubber hits the road, as it were, is a debate that old school church even had over whether to have missions organizations. If you're sending out home missionaries or foreign missionaries, is should this be run as by a board or by a commission? Again, this sounds like, well, it's just a kind of administrative decision. But what, what was happening with the idea of boards a board that was running, say, foreign missions agency, was that you would have some pastors, some elders, but then you'd also have a number of moneyed people because you need money to send people overseas. And so it wasn't clear how much these agencies might be influenced by wealthy people on them. But it especially wasn't clear for old school Presbyterians committed to Presbyterian government that this was being properly overseen by the actual officers in the church. So there was a major debate about this. Um, Craig Troxell, if you know that name, one of our, our pastors who had been at Calvary Glenside, but then also Wheat, Wheaton, and now he's uh, teaching at Westminster Seminary, California. Uh, he wrote his dissertation on this controversy. And um, Here's an example from um, James Henley Thornwell in this case against um, church boards. He writes, in our recent contest, one great principle for which the church was so zealously contending was that of ecclesiastical responsibility. The first enormous and commanding uh, evil of the voluntary societies, think back to the second pretty good awakening, which arrested attention and aroused opposition was their absolute independence of the authority and jurisdiction of the church. For years, consequently, her efforts were directed to, single point, to the single point that the church as such should have the control of all the spiritual enterprises of Christian benevolence. It was not a subject of discussion how the church could most efficiently conduct these matters in her ecclesiastical capacity. By common consent, it was admitted that societies or specific organizations for the purpose were indispensably necessary and the church felt that she would gain her point and secure the desired oversight and control by placing these societies or organizations under her own supervision. I'll stop there for now. We don't have to go through all of that. Again, he's making a, a case for having commissions. These are committees that are formed as part of a general assembly or part of a, of a presbytery to oversee this. And if you know the, his, the OPC's structure, we have standing committees that oversee the work of foreign missions, home missions, and uh, Christian education, among others. The OPC has come down on the side of committees or commissions synonymously rather than having boards. Um, so that's just one example, practical example, of where this Presbyterian ecclesiology leads. Um, so 
there, by the way, is a picture of James Henley Thornwell uh, from this mag journal, Pres um, Confessional Presbyterian. He was a Southerner, uh, South Carolina, important figure in Southern Pres Presbyterian church history. Now, um, this is, these are a couple of paragraphs from the OPC's Book of Church Order, uh, which again underscore this uh, importance of thinking about church government in relation to, to the, the, uh, the hands into which Christ has placed uh, the, the ministry of the church. <clears throat> so I call your attention here first to this second paragraph, point two. There is therefore but one king and head of the church, the only mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ, who rules in his church by his word and spirit. His mediatorial office includes all the offices in his church. It belongs to his majesty from his throne of glory, not only to rule his church directly, but also to use the ministry of men in ruling and teaching his church through his word and spirit, thus exercising through men his own authority and enforcing his own laws. The authority of all such ministerial office rests upon his appointment who has ordained government in his church, revealed its nature to us in his word, and promised his presence in the midst of his church as this government is exercised in his name. So there we have this very important point, Presbyterian church polity, that Christ is the head of the church. And this is set in the context earlier in the 16th and 17th centuries when Presbyterians are making this case in England and Scotland. This means Christ is the head of the church, not the Pope, nor the King. The King, of Queen of England now, is still technically the head of the Church of England. So Presbyterianism is trying to restore Christ to his full headship over the church. And then the next point here, Christ orders his church by the rule of his word, the pattern of officers, ordinances, government, and discipline set forth in scriptures, therefore to be observed as the instruction of the Lord. Church government must conform to the scriptural pattern and follow the specific provisions re revealed in the, no in the New Testament. In those circumstances, not specifically ordered by scripture, the church must observe the general rules of the word. Among the biblical admonitions applicable to all circumstances are those requiring that all things must be decently in order and for edification. A particular form of church government is bound to set forth what Christ requires for order of his church and to arrange particular circumstances only in the manner to the degree and for the purposes that the Lord of the church has appointed in scripture. The Presbyterian form of government seeks to fulfill these scriptural requirements for the glory of Christ, the edification of the church, and the enlargement of that spiritual liberty in which Christ has set us free. I'll stop there. Um, and just throw in uh, for, for a little add-on here. Um, what's striking about Presbyterian church government, which many of us in the OPC and many of us who've been in it as long as I've been, um, is, is how, how much we just take it for granted. But it, the, I still don't think it's entirely clear how the origins of Presbyterian church government came. But John Calvin, in 1541, when he returned to Geneva to carry on the reforms of that church there, wrote something called the Ecclesiastical Ordinances, which was a call for having these officers of pastors, elders, deacons, as well as teaching officers, um, ordained teachers, which is, we actually have four offices in the, in the OPC following Calvin's pattern. But that was really almost unheard of. Up until then, the general way of overseeing or governing the church was by bishops. The Episcopal system was the norm. Of course, going all the way up to the papacy itself as the universal bishop. Um, and, and I still think we need more attention to how that happened, but this is then what prods Protestants in England and Scotland to try to reform the churches there by following a Presbyterian form of church government. It was very novel uh, in the 15th and 16th centuries. There was a much pushback from bishops and kings and the Presbyterians also gave it pretty good because it led to a civil war in England in 1640s which led to the execution of Charles II 
um, this, this incredible thing of regicide. But um, it, it, as, as sort of, I don't know, uh, maybe bland as Presbyterian church government may seem if you look, look at a book of church order, there's a really um, dramatic history behind it and old school Presbyterianism and Machen himself being committed to that and trying to have a Presbyterian church, which I'll talk about more tomorrow, uh, is, is the, the fruit of that older effort going all the way back to John Calvin in Geneva. So I will conclude then with um, a little excerpt from Machen's book, Christianity and Liberalism, which I'll, I'll say more about tomorrow. Uh, all these teasers, again, to get you back. Um, but Machen here is make, making a pretty important point about ordination um, and how, how uh, necessary that is in the church for, again, tr in some ways what we might call in the business world quality control. You have to, you have to control the quality of your product. And you want to make sure that you have good people in the ministry who are, who are going to adhere to what the church is called to proclaim, uh, governed by its constitution. So Machen writes here, Christian officers in the church should perform their duty in deciding upon the qualifications of candidates for the ministry. The question for Christ or against him constantly arises in the examination of candidates for ordination. Attempts are often made to obscure the issue. It is often said, the candidate will no doubt move in the direction of the truth. Let him now be sent out excuse me, to learn uh, as well as to preach. And so another opponent of the gospel enters the councils of the church. <clears throat> it's almost like a situation sort of in the 1830s when you had this mixed enterprise of congregational and Presbyterian churches. And another false prophet goes forth to encourage sinners, sinners to become the judgment seat, to come before the judgment seat of God clad in the miserable rags of their own righteousness. Such action is not really kind to the candidate himself. It is never kind to encourage a man to enter into a life of dishonesty. The fact often seems to be forgotten that the evangelical churches are purely voluntary organizations. No one is required to enter into their service. If a man cannot accept the belief of such churches, there are other ecclesiastical bodies in which he can find a place. The belief of the Presbyterian church, for example, is plainly set forth in the Confession of Faith and the church will never afford any warmth of communion or engage with any real vigor in her work until her ministers are in wholehearted agreement with that belief. It is strange how in the interests of an utterly false kindness to men, Christians are sometimes willing to re relinquish their loyalty to the crucified Lord. I mean, when I read that, I just think back so much to the 1830s and the controversies that produced the old school Presbyterian church. Whether, I, don't, I still don't know for, for certain how much Machen was aware of that controversy or how much it was just sort of part of the air in which he, he breathed growing up in the Southern Presbyterian church and didn't necessarily need to know the story of it. I, I don't know that, but it's, it's very hard uh, not to see the ties between what transpired in the 1830s in the Presbyterian Church and what Machen is doing in the 18, 1920s and 1930s. So I'll, I'll stop there, um, pause, I, uh, stop, not pause, but I, I will take questions. We have about 10 minutes for that if you would like. Could, and I, I'd be happy to explain anything because I presented a lot of material. Go ahead. Just a terminology question. When you say old school is that what we call them, or is that what they call themselves? Both. Okay, they said that, okay. And yeah. so it was a group within? Well, they formed a separate communion. Oh, okay. okay. For a while, they didn't, have, they didn't have fellowship, fraternal relations with the New School Presbyterians. So they had to have a formal mechanism for reuniting, which they did in 1869. But in, I don't know if you could have been ordained in a New School church I don't think they would have reordained you if you moved into new school. I mean, old, from new school to old school, I don't know how those mechanics work, but they were two separate assemblies, et cetera. Yes? Um, was Sunday school in America before or after the beginning of Sunday school over in Britain? 
Uh, should I repeat these questions, Joe, by the way, for the sake of... Yeah, it may help just for the sake of... Okay. Uh, first question was about old school, the terminology. Uh, the second question has to do with the relationship between American Sunday schools and British Sunday schools. And Brit usually Americans were a few years behind. They were pretty much taking their cues from this, from English or British Protestants. I thought that was right, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> right. Uh, there's, I mean, as much as the United States established independence from Britain, uh, there's still incredible affinity between the two countries, which of course we know in the 20th century with going into war for Britain twice in a major way. Um, they were probably our closest allies still are very close. I mean, so the cultural affinities and much of that cultural background is informed by Protestantism of a certain kind um, carried on. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am. James Henley Thornwell? The question is who he is, was. Um, he was a Southern Presbyterian divine, uh, both a pastor and a theologian and a professor. He was also I th associated, may have been president at a time. I don't know for sure of the, what became the University of South Carolina. Uh, so a very prominent figure in South Carolinian Presbyterianism. He died. Um, just into the, the Civil War, um, but he was one of the probably biggest voices for old school Presbyterianism in the South. Um, rivaled in some ways by Robert Louis Dabney, Dabney living much longer, Dabney eventually having at the end of his career teaching at Austin Seminary here in, in Texas, and a bitter old man, as it turned out, because um, he did not take the loss during the Civil War well. Uh, but that's a different story. Yes, sir. You may have covered this earlier. Um, came in late. Uh, when you guys talk about the, the missions and the board of commissions, was there any board that uh, supported the indigenous not only indigenous missionaries, but them governing themselves, like uh, them being the board. So you're talking about foreign missions, foreign missions yes. and supporting indigenous churches overseas. Yes. That, in my understanding of f history of foreign missions, that is something that comes later in the 19th century, and it isn't necessarily the shared view. It's the view that the OPC has adopted now over time, how, how successful we are is, a, is another question. But um, a man by the name of, I forget his first name, but his last name was Nevius, was responsible for, for this, for seeing the importance of having indigenous churches overseen by indigenous people. Um, and yeah, so that does eventually come. And how they, I mean, there are Reformed churches and Presbyterian churches that have grown up that are now indigenous churches in Asia, South Asia, uh, Indonesia, et cetera. How much they have tracked with any of these debates, I, I don't know. Yes, sir. Right. Huh. <laughs> so the question has to do with the millennialism of the old schoolers. I would say overall, overall they were post-mill. They were probably um, cautious in some ways, more cautious than, than some. Um, and, but even, say, going down to uh, Benjamin Warfield, who was one of Machen's professors at Princeton when Machen was a student. And maybe one of the greatest professors at Princeton Seminary of all time. Hodge probably produced more. In well, it would be it would be a it would be a close race between Hodge and and uh, Warfield. 
But Warfield was, if you read a number of his sermons and essays, he was pretty post-millennial. Um, what I think broke that, and especially broke it in Machen's case, uh, was World War I. Uh, I, didn't, I guess I didn't mention that Machen uh, in 1918 went to serve in World War I, not as a soldier, not as a chaplain, but as a uh, secretary in the YMCA. Uh, where he tried to evangelize, lead Bible studies. He also mixed hot chocolate and sold cigarettes to uh, soldiers at the front in France. And it, I, I, mean, I don't think Machen was a happy-go-lucky guy before that, but I think he came back very much sobered by uh, what was happening in Europe uh, and um, not, in, if, not in any way believing that there was progress in the world. So yeah, I mean, it takes, it, I think it takes that for amillennialism to sort of make more sense, uh, which happens with people like Gerhardus Voss, who taught a biblical theology at Princeton Seminary as well. Yes, maybe this will be the last question since we're almost to the hour, unless there's another, any, any questions online, but no. Go ahead, ma'am. Oh, um, it's called The Church of God, An Essential Element of the Gospel by, um, not, not William Childs, by Stuart Robinson. I, I gave the wrong author. Stuart Robinson, Robinson is the author's name. The OPC has reprinted it, and you can go to the OPC website and, and pick up a copy fairly inexpensively. It's very short. It's it's pretty heady stuff, um, very, very uh, exegetical. I mean, it's not in the order of the kind of, a lot of the Presbyterian material can get uh, arguing for elders, rule by elders, assemblies, et cetera, arguments against Epis Epis Episcopacy can get fairly technical sometimes. Uh, but this is, um, uh, Robinson is being very theological here uh, and biblical, which is really, makes it a great read, I think. All right. All right. Step down. I won't touch anything. I might break it. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Hart. Sure. Well, we, uh, we do have some refreshments. We have a book table in the Fellowship Hall. Um, welcome to, to stay for a while. Uh, Catch Dr. Hart uh, on a side side table and, and just ask him some questions that you might not, want to, not might not have wanted to ask in front of everybody, uh, but please uh, just feel free to go into the fellowship hall and look around there. Um, we will we will reconvene tomorrow morning at 9:30. The doors will open at, at a, around nine or so. There'll probably be some of us here, you know, sometime between 8:30 and nine. Um, but uh, look forward to seeing uh, you all and maybe some additional folks tomorrow morning. And uh, thanks for joining us uh, online. And we will see you, Lord willing, tomorrow. Thank you.